This is episode number 25 of DevOps Paradox with Darren Pope and Victor Farsik. I am Darren. And I am Victor. 25. It's our 25th anniversary. Yeah. Supposedly, uh, the, the 25th anniversary is all about being brilliant and radiant. I just got from, back from the gym. I'm really radiant at this point. That's n- neither of those two is me. But, but yeah, I'm, and I'm not brilliant at this point because I just got back from the gym. So with that part said, uh, if you've been listening to all the episodes, thanks for listening. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We get to have some fun doing this and, uh, you know, hopefully you're getting some, some useful information out of it. And today's topic is about conferences. We got this question from Jay in the podcast channel over in the Slack team, DevOps 20. We'll talk more about that later. How do you see conferences now and has that changed over time? And if so, how and why? Now, I, I let me s- start from my point because okay. it's rare I get to go to conferences <laughs> because I'm always at clients now. Other other than going to our company sponsored conference this year, that's the first conference I've been to since our company sponsored conference last year. Now, that means I'm not taking care of my own career stuff and everything, so don't shoot me out for that, but that's just me. However, you on the other hand are at a conference probably every other weekend. Yes, something like that. I, I also don't go as a as attendee. I go as a speaker, uh, almost always. But still, uh, what I think is happening is that conferences are becoming more and more commercial, which is not necessarily bad. Kind of everybody needs to earn salary, kind of, and I understand that. Uh, but uh, I see more and more conferences where they have that attitude. Uh, can you come to t- talk to our conference? Yes. Uh, how do you want to proceed with uh, flight and hotel expenses? Oh, we're not paying anything. And that really goes to my nerves. It's kind of, I think that more and more conferences expecting that people are going to pay from their own pocket to come and speak, which might work well for some, but it doesn't work for me at all. Not because I cannot afford it again, but the whole attitude about, hey, you're so, you should be so privileged to be able to come and speak on our conference from which we earn money that we you should pay expenses. And, uh, and it's not about those expenses themselves, but it's more about uh, the trend that more and more companies are definitely willing to, to pay to speak. And more and more conferences expect everything to be paid to speak. And that might not really represent the needs of the people who are attending those conferences. When I was, I used to speak at conferences a lot back in the late 90s and very early 2000s. Um, It was primarily in the database space, Microsoft and SQL Server. So yes, I used to be a DBA. Um, (laughs) but not DB2. Go back and listen to a previous episode. You'll get the, you'll get the joke. Uh, I always had to pay for my travel, but it was different. When somebody approaches you as a speaker and it's like, please come speak at our conference. The, the implied thing in that is, hey, we're going to take care of at least part of your travel. Maybe not all of it, but hey, we can, we can put you up in the hotel uh, for the official nights of the conference, but we can't cover if you want to come in early, you'll have to cover that, but we'll, we'll pay for your flight regardless. But if you want extra nights on the front or back, you need to pay for those, which I think would be a more than fair, uh, compensation, uh, compensation, a, a fair solution. Yeah. So, and just to make it clear that if it's a community conference, I have absolutely no problem financing all the expenses kind of. So we are organizing something and we are just full of enthusiasm and we want to hear great people or not so great in my case, uh, speak about some subjects. And to me, that's all okay. We should, I work in a software company and we should be support, supporting community and all those things. Uh, I'm fully in for it. 
And in that case, better let it let that money. If they do have money to finance somebody, let that go to somebody who is maybe freelancer or something like that. Somebody who cannot really get the company to back them up. But commercial ones, that's a tricky one. Oh no, I don't think it's tricky at all. You've you've already answered what's going on. If it's a commercial conference and you have been asked by that conference to come speak and they are unwilling to cover travel. Now we can get into meals or anything else, but at least the travel and lodging. Exactly. That's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, like again, going back to my example before I was never asked, right? I was just submitting papers and they would approve it. I'd pay for it out of my pocket. Usually it would be in cool places like I spoke in Orlando uh, for a Microsoft conference, I believe it was. And so my wife and daughter came along. They went to Disney. They did they did the the family stuff while I was at the conference. Same thing. I think I spoke at a side or I think I flipped it around. It was or Sybase was Orlando and I spoke in San Francisco, surpri- surprisingly, at the same hotel that we used to be at uh, with the company thing uh that was in 99 so it's like i've been in that hotel for many years um but again and that was probably one of my better rooms i had my my topic used to be care and feeding of your sql server right sort of a even in 99 i I could sort of have cool headlines um and we'd pack out that room which was cool and people thought I was like, oh, I knew everything or whatever. It's like, no, I don't know Jack. I just know because I was a practitioner. I wasn't a consultant. I was I was the guy that was up at two and three o'clock in the morning dealing with the mess. So I sort of went off track there. But anyway, I'm, I'm saying all that to say that I was able to leverage that to take my family and sort of get a quote unquote free vacation. I got some learning. We got to hang out with family. It was good, right? But it did come out of my pocket because I wasn't a main stage speaker. But I was okay with that because it worked out. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that it should always be paid. But, you know, the the problem I have is that I'm very, very rigorous. So sometimes I work with companies and then I talk to them about commercial or open source offerings and, and, you know, trying to suggest stuff. But on a conference, I try to be open source 100% because I don't think that my role there is to come and sell them something. My role there is to tell them that there is something cool that they might want to explore, yeah. right? Now, let's say that my company, our company pays for uh, all the expenses. How long am I going to speak about something that is not commercial f- on the stage if they're pay- paying absolutely everything? Should I? Hmm. I think I think it goes to the 80/20 rule. And here's the reason why. I think it's fair to have great content. And I deliver 80% pure content that can be actionable without commercial. Yeah. I also don't feel bad about spending 20% of the time these are rough numbers talking about by the way, you could do this yourself. It would take you this long. However, we do have a commercial solution that is basically a one-click solution. I don't have a problem with that, right? Because uh-huh. if, as long as I've given good content, it, it said differently, I haven't been up there the whole hundred percent of the time pitching a product. No, even, that's that's the big difference, though. Even even hundred percent is not necessarily bad. The question is, if you're coming there to pay to speak. Then uh, what's the criteria? Why are you speaking and not somebody else? Right? So basically, are the people who are coming to the conference coming to hear something that is useful for them or they're paying from their own pockets for the tickets so that they can uh, be given sales pitches? And that's the problem. That's the thing I have a problem with because if, let's say that I'm an attendee, if I'm going to pay pay sometimes considerable amount of money. Sometimes it goes over a thousand bucks only for the ticket plus additional expenses. And then I'm going to be pretty des- uh, treated as, as, as if a sale person came not knocking on my door. That's really questionable. It is. I, th- I think one of the things, again, I don't go to that many conferences, but 
in in full disclosure, I think it would be wise for the conference organizers to mark any of those kinds of sessions as sponsored by. Right? Yes. And that's comp- then you as the attendee can make the choice of, hey, look, I know I'm going to go in and be pitched. Am I okay with that? I think that's okay. It's just a matter of sometimes you see some really cool titles because they've got a really good marketing department behind them. And, but they don't have that sponsor by, and you show up and it's just somebody from the marketing department talking about the product. Yeah. And and, and, that that, is- and that's okay. But I want, I want the attendees to be aware that really this is going to be a pitch fest. Yeah. I mean, there, there is nothing necessarily wrong with marketing talking about something and sales guys talking about something. There is nothing wrong about that. What is wrong is that attendee pays to hear that. That's that's what's wrong. That would be the same thing as if you would have uh, paid uh, television, paid to view television, right? With commercials. Well, that's what we do all the time with cable and satellite. Oh, but, but okay, so let's play that out for just a second because let's say that you had a conference that was nothing but sponsored talks, right? Yes. So, which will go there. But you're attendee ticket and it's a, let's say it's a three-day conference and your attendee ticket is only 50 to 75 dollars go with it because and because they're covering because in that 50 to 75 dollars you're getting a little bit of conference swag and you're getting snacks and maybe even some meals thrown in so that 50 to 75 dollars quote unquote is covering those things which i know in reality it doesn't however Exact same scenario, but the conference fee is now a thousand dollars. That's where I have the problem. If it's not being disclosed, if it's being disclosed, then you're making a choice. Now, here's the problem. Usually, when you're trying to buy the early bird ticket, the full schedule hasn't been published yet, so you're just taking the chance on it being good content. But is that okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, fifty, sixty, hundred bucks. That's all good. Thousand is not. Yeah, or what? Whatever that breaking point is for you personally, I. It, but yeah, I, that's that's where I have sort of a problem with it. Now, we've been talking about in-person conferences. We're we're in 2019. Online conferences are a big deal. Virtual conferences, if you will, or some people uh, say they are. What do you think? So, th- I still be- I still prefer kind of eye to eye conferences for a couple of reasons. First, because there is something in 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 being live to begin with, uh, and if it's online, so if I go to a conference, I'm dedicating one day, two day, three three days of my life to that, and I'm going to pay attention. That's the reason why I'm there, and so on and so forth, right? If it's online, then at least in my case, I don't know how are other people. If it's online, then, oh, I can watch it tomorrow. Uh, no, not even tomorrow. I, I have things to do. So it's a, I never end up watching things that are online simply because there is always something else that I have to do. This is kind of, to me, conference is focused. You have two days, let's say, or whatever the duration is, when you're not in your office when you're not uh, doing whatever you need to do so you have the ability to dedicate your attention to learning or whatever the reason is for you being at the conference okay you touched on a you touched on a very interesting point there i'm going to hold that keep going keep going if 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 people if online conference first of all if it would be online i would say you can watch it online it there will be no recording uh, so that people have to kind of decide to attend it in a way. and But then you will still need to uh, manage to convince their managers or whomever is managing their time, people's time. It's kind of, yes, I'm not working today. How often does that happen when it's online? Uh, never. And let me go ahead and jump back in. I'm not working today because I'm watching it online you know you're going to get interrupted 
right? That just is natural for an online thing. However, it's happened to me and I've seen it happen to numerous people. You're at an in-person conference and your phone goes off and you've got a SEV1 at a conference and you're having to deal with it. Now you're missing the conference. When that really is a bad thing is when you have paid because the company that you work for didn't want to pay for the conference. So you paid out of your pocket for the travel, for the lodging, for the conference fee, everything. And now you're getting called in by the day job to take care of this. Whatever the SEV1 is. That's where it really sucks. Because there has to be an expectation set, especially in that one case to where you have paid personally for everything out of pocket. That's like, hey, I'm on vacation. I don't care if the server room's on fire. It's your problem. And that I believe that's an expectation that we as the attendees have to set with our employers. That this is what's going to happen if a scenario occurs. It's like, I'm gone. Treat me as if I'm on a remote island with nothing. Yeah, except that it's not vacation. I'm here actually to figure something out, to learn something that I can apply when I get back to the office. Maybe something I'm going to read about or practice or whatever, right? So it's not, I'm not supposed to do the usual work during those days, but I'm not on vacation. This is work. And that's why I get surprised in Eastern Europe. I don't know whether that happens in some parts of US, but in Euro- Eastern Europe, as a general rule, conferences are over the weekend. I think there are, I think there are some in the US that tend to be weekend. Here's the funny thing. The ones that are not commercial tend to be over the weekends. The ones that are commercial are during the week. Why do you think is that? Hmm. I have opinions that I don't know that I want to live on in posterity. Um, the, I, I think the short, I think the short of it is, is because people don't want to work on the weekend, even though, because we're behind the scenes, we know that the people actually are putting on the conference are working their butts off four days in advance and a couple of days after. Right. So I, I, I know it's not that, but sometimes perception is not real. My theory is simply if it's over big days, then people would not come because the companies where they work would not let them. So where some t- often companies are like, oh yeah, you can go to the conference as long as this does not affect your work in any form of way. So basically you can go on a conference if it's your vacation or a weekend. Because I have nothing out of it. It's kind of, it's, it's you. It's, it's fun. And, and trust me, if, if you want to go only for fun, go on to the beach. Don't go to a conference. Conference is not about being having fun. It, there should be fun. There should be fun in conference. Let me clarify that. But the main purpose is not to have fun. I can imagine many other ways to have fun than to listen to talk after talk, right? It's learning. And companies sometimes don't perceive it like that. I would say most of the time companies do not perceive it like that. They see it as overhead, much like training. And I think this is also because you can sort of clump conferences in with training. Uh, some people have good training budgets that it's like, hey, go take these classes. You'll never use anything that you learn from it, but hey, Go take the class anyway. And that's sort of the same mentality as a conference for some people. It's like, oh yeah, go to the conference, but eh. You know, unless you're a vendor of some sort where, hey, maybe you're making, you're, you're meeting with some people, you're, you know, pitching your product a little bit, whatever the case may be. Um, there's usually not just a pure, un- unless you're paying for it out of your own pocket, there's usually an ulterior motive that is in play. Exactly. And, the countries I mentioned happen to be the countries where, where most of the IT is in consulting. So try to find the relation there. Uh, because, you know, when it's consulting, you rent people. You don't really have interest in quality. You don't have interest in new stuff. Can you write get setters? Yes, go, go work for those guys. Uh, but anyways, go, going back to your subject of online uh, very quickly. 
Uh, I, I mentioned how why I don't think it's a it's is the best idea for for attendees, but there is even more important reason. Who, online is horrible for the person who is speaking. It's horrifyingly bad. At least when that person is good. Okay, so why do you say that? Because when you're on a stage, you're speaking to people, you're looking at their reactions, you're looking at their faces. You're trying to discover, oh, is this part too boring for you? Should I, should I jump through it or should I continue? Do you know this? How? You do or you don't. Oh, I should go in more details about that. It is, even though it is, most of the talk is going in one direction, only a single person speaks, it is a communication with the audience. And you see their faces, you, you know how to adjust. You can start with the question, who is using Kubernetes? Everybody, excellent. So we're not going to talk about uh, basics, right? Or nobody. Oh, let me tell you what it is. So, and when it's online, you don't have that communication. You cannot read the reaction of the audience and your talk is going to be bad. Because what will happen is, even if you're probably one of the best live speakers, you're going to be making assumptions about your online attendees that, hey, normally I throw this joke in here. Well, that joke may be totally mistimed, inappropriate, fill in the blank in an online scenario. Exactly. Yeah. On, I, I, I have sort of a mixed reaction with online because I sort of treat like AWS reInvent as one of the big monster conferences. I went to the first three uh, as an attendee. That third one was like, I don't need to come back here anymore. And nowadays, they stream every one of their keynotes, every one of their sessions live. Why would I want to go to Vegas yet one more time? Right. So I, I, I don't feel it. But at least I can. I think I think AWS is doing it in an interesting way. It's because they are streaming everything, and I know what the schedule is, and I know it's going to be on YouTube. Even if I don't watch it live, I know it's going to be there. I can go and look at the playlist and grab it later because most, and this is AWS is sort of those weird ones. It is a pitch fest the whole time, but in their content, at least forget the keynotes, but the side sessions where they're introducing, okay, here's the new features that are working with our, this, this new announcement we made, right? Even though they're they it goes high level. They're really good at going reasonably deep as well. And I think they're one of the few that do online really well. They do. They're fantastic at, in every aspect of, of, of how, how they do that. How they, how they do it. Now, it's a separate discussion whether, whether uh, I like it or not, but they're, they're really doing it well. Uh, but still, the, it is questionable. So let's say if that same conference, if that same thing was done as uh, pre recorded in a studio stuff, do you think that it would be as interesting? I think for anything that is any product that already existed from them, it's about the same. However, when it's a fresh product, because the way that they shoot their rooms is you can still see a majority of the people in the room. You know, you're looking over their heads, but you're, you're looking over eight, 10, 15 rows of people that are usually anywhere from halfway to fully packed. And you can sort of see body reactions and see how people are taking it. To me, that's interesting just as a, as somebody that watches people. Uh, I, 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 and that's what I'm saying is on, on the initial release of a product, those are more interesting to see live and see what people's reactions are to them live. Cause it, when it's live, even though you're not watching it there makes you feel like you're there. Isn't that similar to like daily show or one of those talk shows where you're watching it really on television, but it makes it somehow more entertaining because there are people in the audience. Correct. Instead of not if, so maybe it's, not, maybe just, it's, it's a, not just a tight shot on the person talking it's you, you even though it's a wider shot you see you see the people and when you see especially larger numbers of people that tends to lead to hey lots of people are interested in this maybe i should be interested interested in this as well but here here's the pitch the people who really get most out of the conference 
are not the people who attend all the talks. They're the people who attend the talk that they like and come and form a group after the talk, usually with whomever presented it, and have a discussion on that. I, th I think that the, the benefit of a conference is what's happening in corridors, not on the stage. That's the real deal. Right. I, I'm in complete 100% agreement on that. Because there were times, especially back when I was talking, I made a lot of good friends and we carried, you know, as long as I was in that space, we, we had, I mean, when I had problems, and of course, this was early years of internet, um, email was even sort of new at that point. We, we were just beyond AOLs, you have mail. Um, it, it felt like real community at that point. And now it's it's a little harder, I think, to even though we have numerous ways to get in touch with people, we almost have too many. And most of us also forget about just a phone <laughs> to call people, um, which is one of the simplest forms of anything. So conferences, as a speaker, it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to go do a gig. We question whether or not you should do a gig if it's a commercial conference and they're unwilling to pay for anything. Now, yes. it's up to you, though, because it may be a great positioning, especially if you're a consultant. Maybe that is that is a good position you're looking at as marketing for your consulting gig. But if you're not a self-employed consultant, it would be questionable. Yeah. And also, even if you're a consultant, there is a very limited or whatever type of marketing that you want to get out for yourself and you're ready to invest. It, there is a very limited number of events in that case that makes sense. Maybe if you're a consultant, you're most likely going to work for a customer in your area. So you're not going to travel on the other side of the continent uh, because nobody knows about you. <laughs> uh, nobody wants your services. Um, but actually, that might not be true. It depends on the type of consultancy, right? Uh, or... If you're a commercial company like we are, right? And then the event is in country where we have no commercial offering. Why, why would we do that, right? So, but yes, if you want to do self-marketing, pay to talk. I agree. Okay. So we, we've talked about real, I was starting to close, but I've got one more point I want to bring up. Um, so we talked about live conferences, commercial, community driven. You know, it's still all in person. We talked about online pluses and minuses, but what about unconferences, which has always been a sort of weird buzzword. So this would be sort of the DevOps days to where it's self-organizing, even though that's not true because DevOps days is highly organized. You know, what, what about those basically what I'll call birds of a feather conferences? Where, where does that come into play? That's, that's the, that's the best one. That's if you can choose one, go to those. Uh, I, I love it because that's basically. You remember how I, ten minutes ago I said the most interesting things uh, on conferences are actually uh, communication and then what's happening in corridors between talks, right? And conferences are like that basically. It's more spontaneous. It's more about uh trying to figure out what makes sense to learn from other experiences so, so on and so forth it's less scripted so i th i think it's i think it's really great but every time I, I went to something that resembles some conference i i had a great time and i learned a lot always i think the reason why those work out well and this is where especially commercial conferences could learn is that you have to be able to bake in enough breaks so people can actually talk to each other. If you've programmed an event to where there's a 15 minute break in the morning and a 15 minute break in the afternoon, and you're going straight from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and you know all you have is a break, lunch break. Number one, your sponsors, if you have sponsors, aren't going to be very happy because the expo floor isn't going to have a lot of people, right? So it's all these things. I, I think even you know when when you even block time for the expo hall, making sure people have time to get to the expo hall. Uh, I still think you need to have even more time to allow people to actually talk to each other, but don't assume that people will talk to each other because if it was left up to me, I'd go back to the hotel room, and take a nap. 
<laughs> so you've got to come up with ways to make people uh, try to communicate with each other, whether it's having, which I'll call formal organized birds of a feather session, meaning, hey, there's slots here. There's nothing really official going on, but here's, instead of just having the four concurrent tracks we've got during these couple of slots, we're going to have up to 10 different things that are happening. And if you want to go great, they're no, they're not going to be any longer than 10 minutes. Go for it. I, th I think that's, I think that's where a lot of event organizers and programmers tend to fall apart is they don't give enough breathing room. Cause very often, because the goal is to have as packed schedule as possible, not what you just described. Right. I, the one I like the most in that aspect is, and I'm not saying maybe that's not the only one where that's happening, but that's the only one where I saw it, uh, in DockerCon, uh, they would have the whole area for a lot of people, uh, just to communicate. And they made it orchestrated in a way that we know that people, a lot of people in IT are nerds. They're not going to kind of just come up with stuff. So we're going to give you a software system that you can propose a topic and you can join a topic uh, or you can ask for a topic. So anyway, a bunch of small groups were organized and then a huge amount of people were spent more time there speaking with whomever about whatever than in talks. It was brilliant. But that's the only conference I've been in where there was a dedicated area where you can sit and discuss something and that something is organized in advance in a way that there is a system how to figure out what to talk about. Yeah, and we're already sort of over, but I want to bring up one more point. Um, at, at a non-technical conference, I didn't attend it, but it's I'm on the guy's mailing list. Uh, they had a concept that they called a genius. I think they called it a genius bar or something. Uh, it probably wasn't genius bar because Apple would probably slap their hands. <laughs> but they had a bunch of vendors in that were associated to this conference. However, the vendors didn't pay for the space and they weren't allowed to pitch their product. They were there to help. Now, they could talk about their product, but they, it wasn't like, hey, sign up for my product like you would typically do. So that was sort of the the rules of engagement. And based on the, the reports for both the attendees and the event organizer, they said that was probably the biggest win of the whole event because people could just come in, ask their questions, feel confident that, you know, hey, look, this, this might be a vendor I want to work with in the future. Or it's like, no, nah, I don't want to, but I still got good information from them. And I think that's where, as a vendor going in, that, that could be a really, that, that could be an interesting part of maybe not so much an expo hall, but off to that side to where you've got examples of people that can actually just answer the questions, right? Without getting, without getting all marketing about it or pushy about it. It's just, let's answer questions. Instead of uh, trying to get as many leads as possible that you're going to throw to the trash because they're useless. <coughs> <coughs> What? No, what? No. Um, okay. So let's, let's go ahead and wrap this up. So conferences, you should, you should go if for, for another, no other reason, uh, just to know that there's other humans out there and that you're not the only one that's probably dealing with the problems, problems that you are dealing with. This is true for technical conference or conferences or any other type of conference. Um, human interaction still is key. I don't think we're opposed to online, but human is better. Yes. That does not mean that you shouldn't search online for tutorials and then reading and watching and stuff like that. That I, I'm, I think that the comment is limited exclusively to conference type of stuff, right? Yes. Because online, you can't sit down and share an adult beverage. Well, you can, but it'll be a little weird. You can't clink the glass. Um, anyway. The, uh, and, and you sort of nailed it. Don't, don't, uh, not search for tutorials and books. And oh, by the way, dang, you've got some books. You got lots of books. <laughs> the latest book is, uh, DevOps Toolkit 2.6, all about Jenkins X. Yes. Uh, how, how many uh, revisions have you published on that so far? Uh, awesome. officially only two because only two. Yeah. Yeah. Unofficially since the first chapter. Uh, 
but yeah just uh, when is this is a public message to Jenkins X when are you gonna stop turning new features then I can move to something else instead of writing a new chapter every second week okay I'll it's just, a good I'll thing look. it's a good uh, thing it, it's a good thing I'm gonna let I'm gonna let that sit uh, the other thing too DevOps paradox which is we basically got the approval to use the name we'll put it that way yeah but uh that book's out. How, what kind of feedback have you been getting on that? Uh, great. I, I don't know. People like it. It's Sometimes they're confused because they're used that uh, when I read something that comes or is related to me that is full of examples and very hands-on. And this is more like a pillow talk with uh, different people. Um, so uh, I don't I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> I, I don't know what does it mean. Pillow, okay, it does, it, it's fine. No, pillow talk is usually referred back to some sort of sensual experience. Or maybe okay, you didn't I, mean that. I, I don't. It's know. referred to conversation after that experience. Okay, not to enough. the experience let's, itself. Okay, let's <laughs> let's keep moving along. So moving along. Uh, this is a message to everybody listening. If I say something stupid or inappropriate, that's because English is not my major, uh, my primary language. So I can say whatever I want, and then you can interpret it any way you want. Okay, I've never asked this question before. What is your primary language? Serbian. It is Serbian. Okay. Yes. Yes. Actually, I, I've been using English and Spanish not being my primary languages for many years now as excuse. Whenever I say something silly, oh, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm Serbian. Yeah, don't, yeah. But see, that's the problem with me. I know English and that's about it, so. <laughs> uh. If you want to ask a question, sort of like Jay did, uh, you can leave us a message in the Slack team DevOps 20, that's DevOps, the number two and the number zero. You can sign up for a free account. If you go to devopsparadox.com, you'll see a link to uh, join the Slack team. Also, there is going to be a link down in the description. If you have a problem signing up, uh, maybe open it up in an incognito window. We had some issues recently, and we're still trying to shake some of those out. Uh, but anyway, if you've never visited it before, you'll probably be fine. Uh, once you get into the team, go and sign up for a free account, join the podcast channel, and ask your questions there. If you want to ask a question, uh, you can also leave us a voice message using Voxer. Once you sign up for a free personal account at Voxer, you can add DevOps Paradox as your contact and leave us a message. Also, if you're listening via Apple Podcasts, which a good majority of you are, uh, please leave a rating and review when you get a chance. There's some instructions below as well how to leave a rating and review if you've never done that before. Uh, finally, all the links to the Slack workspace, the Voxer account, how to leave a review, all below here. Anything else? It sounds like you're hungry. I keep hearing your stomach go off. I don't know if you're hearing it or not, but I'm hearing it in my ears. Uh, okay. That's it. So conference is good. Go do them. Yeah, right? they're good. Some are better than others. But they're good. Try try to focus your time. We're not saying commercial conferences are bad because that's part of what we do. But the community, truly community driven conferences, are usually where you're going to get the most value for your money if you're wanting to learn. Is or foundation or not? driven. Like Kubecon is a Linux foundation. They earn money, a lot of money, but that money goes to a to a good place to maintain a bunch of pro products. Yeah, it's a good thing. Okay, foundation. So if you listen to the end, there was an extra tidbit that we didn't cover during the thing. So that might be a, a good one. So, all right, that's it. You're done. I'm done. I'm done. Thanks again for listening to episode number 25 of DevOps Paradox.